Um, yeah. I, I want you to see this. It's kind of a long one, but a yeah. lot of people really think right. this is one of the best uh, guitar performances. Uh, okay. Live wise, so. Okay, uh, so if Phil, if you want to stop it at any time, right? We could do that. Your thoughts yeah. to do that, right? But we'll, you're um, in for a treat, man. So, since Ooh. we can't have my reaction to it, we're Ooh. just going to go and play it and then talk over it. Uh, we do not own the rights to the song. Um, we're doing this under the Fair Use Act. Um, yeah. We're not make any money on it. If you want to go uh, check out the original performance or or buy it, um, we suggest you do so. Uh, but we do not own this video. This is a reaction video. I'm hoping we cover our butts so we don't get a strike. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, where are we? There we go. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. So we're going to start the video. And here we go. So this is uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan's rendition of uh, Voodoo Child. Turn that down a little bit. And a very famous cover, I might add, and a really good one. And it's a hard song to do. I can't do it. Here's a fun fact. Hey, do you remember when uh, when Hulk Hogan was in the NWO? Yes. This was his intro song. It, it, it was a variation. They couldn't outright use it, but that's yeah. true too. Yeah, but NWO he, I mean, just yeah, yeah. did a whole bunch of clips from Jimi Hendrix and right. Yeah, that was part of the the whole aura that they did. Yeah, right. All right, I'll just pick it up because I I really enjoy the song still. Kenny Wayne Shepherd has a really good version of it too. Ooh, I have to listen to that. Yeah, it's good. Okay, so I have to say this. He's using like I, I play guitar. He's using like ridiculously heavy strings. Yeah. He goes from anywhere from like a twelve gauge to a thirteen gauge. And I there you gotta have some really, really strong hands to deal with that. And I just it just floors me to see him do, do these bends and a, a fender strat has a, a different feel to it. So I it's it's nuts to play with that kind of case string on a on a fender strat. It, yeah, you can tell he's like with his face, he's got the facial yes. expressions just right. Yeah, he's he's into it, but he's having to grab out for dear life. <laughs> Also, another funny story is I think he has broken that guitar neck, if I remember the story correctly. Uh, uh, it took a bad fall or a bump, and his um, his tech was managed to, to put it together. But, yeah. I also have to say that's a lot going on with the effects as well. With the pedal board? Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. The wah is, is you got to be really, really dead on with it. I think he's pretty dead on with every part of this guitar. Right. I love that he's making the guitar sing along with him also. Well, I mean, if you notice with like Jimi Hendrix's stuff, um, he he had that way of making the guitar kind of of of, of sing, uh, like that, like to do like that the melody line. Um, Leslie West was the same way.
God, look at that. Right, I think he drops his guitar pick right there, and then, and then recovered like instantly. Let me back it up a little bit. I said I think what happened. That or he 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 changed a. Uh... No, hang on. Okay, he didn't drop his guitar pick. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna back it up, and I want you to listen for um like a pitch change or oh, like okay. a... Yeah, that's probably what happened. He, he manually went down and altered one of the, the dials on the pedal to get it to do that. Let me back it up a little bit. You, you see that um, the um, the trim bar right there? Yeah. Okay. That's not actually how the trim bar is supposed to be mounted to the guitar. Really? Yeah. So he wanted to have like the same effect like Hendrix's because Hendrix would do that, but because Hendrix would like flip the guitar over, like so instead of playing it like that, he played with the opposite hand. Oh. So it should cause the bar to do that. So that that bar, I can't remember how they had to do that. I don't even know if they had to get that made. But yeah, like that bar, uh, a, a traditional like Fender um, uh, uh, trim bar doesn't sit like that. It's usually the other way around where it's to the bottom, not, on, not hanging on top. So he was trying to replicate this as best he could. Well, I mean, no, no, like that's that's like he's had that he like that guitar has been with him probably just before like before he made it big. It's a really old Strat, sixties, I believe. Okay, yeah, pre pre CVS because of the headstock. Um, I can't remember the specs on this guitar, um, but yeah, um, Fender years ago replicated that guitar to like the scratches and cigarette burns and they had a hard time finding that sticker right there the, it, they it looks like found, it's from like like some sort of a like boat sticker or something yeah i don't remember what it was i, I remember years ago i read a guitar world um uh, article on it and they actually found the source material for it to do uh -huh. like a replica to do those strats and those strats are freaking ridiculously expensive. I really wish I got to see him live. Another crazy thing, I'm surprised I remembered it. He used to have to super glue his freaking calluses back onto his fingertips. Phil? He had to super glue his calluses back on? To his fingertips. So he could, oh my gosh. Because, so, he could play. so he'd be able to play, yeah. Because, I mean, like, um, sometimes, like, you can lose your, like, like, and most people, like me, like, I won't touch a guitar for a while, and my calluses go away. 
and I have to play to get him built back up, well, his would just be because the strings would like come right off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Also, another really funny one, and I and not to promote drug use. There was a bootleg tape of him playing, and you could see him uh, uh, snorting uh, some white powdery substance from a Coke can. You really have to give it to the bassist and the drummer too, because they're they're just so. Kind of- they have a really cool history. Um, maybe I can play it to where I can get to see the bass player again. I, I don't know if we're bringing another one. Okay, so. If I remember correctly, his name is Tommy Shannon. He played bass on like the first couple of um, Johnny Winter records. So that's so he's at so he's done professional works before he he, he got with um, Steve Ray Vaughan. The drummer, uh, the first name escapes me. His last name is. Um, Chris Layton. He is actually the drummer for Kenny Wayne's band now. And I think at one point they both played with Kenny Wayne. Cool. I've actually seen Chris Layton play. Oh, and he's wow. really he's a great tight drummer. Yeah. Um it was in their uh Experience Hendrix uh tour uh, some years ago. It was, it, he's he's really like just a, a pocket player. If you knew how bad I really wanted for the Strat, it'd drive you crazy. <laughs> all my favorite players played Strats. Not all of them, a good chunk of them. Again, adjusting the a knob on a pedal. Yeah. Just look at his face. He's like becoming one with oh, the yeah, he's that guitar. really getting into it. Yeah. And yeah. He's just kind of getting lost in the music now. Right. He's not doing I don't I think a literal uh rendition of the solo. I think he's added some stuff to it. I'm not really sure. Usually when oh. they're long like this, they've improvised. Oh, this is all him, yeah. Yeah. There was something that was said um, by Eric Clapton after he passed that, like, a lot of guys, like, they don't, they'll do like a, like a, a, we'll say like a new idea or a new, a new verse, but then they just repeat it. He said when, when, when Stevie played, he was a constant flow of just like, new things coming out as he didn't he wasn't really repetitious with his playing yeah it's just phenomenal not many players are like that
you have to appreciate the bass player when they play lines like that and you can hear it. Just that low end. Can you, like, you know what, if you think about it, can you imagine, like, how many kids, like, tortured their parents' hearing by wanting to do, like, play, use a wah pedal and, like, do this song? <laughs> I have a wah pedal, and I, I barely have used it. There is something to be said for when a guitar player does that, when they bend a note and they kind of hang on to it, and they're able to do some vibrato to it. That's like one of my favorite freaking things, and it starts to feed back. And then the app starts reacting to it. It's awesome. Make it sing. You know, that type of bending, when you're learning how to do it, will will destroy your hands. <laughs> it's yeah. cool to do if you could do it. and to, But to think that he's got like those 12-gauge strings on that, 12 or 13-gauge strings on that guitar, oh my God. And it's, in, it's perfectly in tone, like it's perfectly in pitch. Oof. Oof. What an epilogue. <laughs> you know, it's just one of those things. He he left this earth like way too soon. <laughs> and I remember the day that he died. I mean, I want not that I was at that venue, but I I remember the day that he died when I found out that he died and I was devastated. And the funny thing was is I was in a bus full of people. Uh, going to Brookwood High School, junior, junior, senior high school. And not many people knew, like, were into blues or into guitar players. Like, that's when I was into playing guitar and stuff like that. And learning, first learning, I heard he passed away. And I was just, uh, I, it, I was devastated. I'd never be able to get to see him play, not live. And he was in Alpine Valley. And just, what a loss. What a loss, but what a what an artist. I mean, one of a kind firebrand. He straightened his life out after um, a lot of drug use. Um, yeah, I, I, for some reason, that performance really sticks out. I, yeah. I, I, amazing guitar player, amazing music, you know, original right. stuff. But, um, yeah, his rendition just. Like you said, it, it just flowed, right. and he made it his own, and that's probably like one of the best times he's done it. It's so good. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. You know what? If you really want to get your mind blown, and now I know, so it, it's kind of a strange thing because you know I had I dealt with ADD that I didn't know I had when I was a kid, when I was a teen, you know, a teenager, stuff like that. And I would do, I did deep dives. And I had heard of a performance that he did with Albert King, who was one of his influences, him and like Lonnie Mack. Anyway, and uh, it was recorded at a, at a studio in uh, Ontario, Canada. I actually have the CD, hang on. Damn 
this out of the way uh that's the cd i don't know if they ever did a vinyl printing of it um they did it was recorded in hamilton ontario ironically enough <laughs> in a studio in hamilton's like i guess i mean i don't i I'm, I'm aware of it but i don't know if it's like a huge city like toronto i think it's in the toronto area Anyway, they did. It was a one-time thing, and it used to be like a bootleg thing. And they actually officially released it as a as a as a, a legit release. It's fantastic. Like he, they they do like some of his songs, like Stevie Ray Ray's. They did Albert King songs, and he was like passing the baton on to Stevie to you know to be, for the blues and stuff like that. It's a fantastic. It's really good. Now, if you're unaware of the story of of so when Stevie was this hot shot local guitarist, Albert hardly ever had anybody play with him. His style is even even now it's like disputed as to what exactly he did. They know that he picked with his fingers, which is a different kind of tone. But so his he had played a flying V left handed and the strings were upside down. So your low E is in the bottom and your high E is on top. And not many people could, could play like him. It remotely. Because it's one note that might be bent going up. He probably went down with it because of the way the guitar, the physics of the guitar was. So there was a, they sat down with each other. Albert let him up. Turned his back to him. And Stevie replicated, like, note for note what he was doing. Ooh. I mean, this is before he ever made it. Like, he was a local guy in the Austin Blues scene. But, yeah, like, just replicate, just spit back what was being played by Albert. And, and Albert didn't play in, like, um, uh, E standard or, like, uh, E flat, D sharp. You know, when you tune it a half step down. It's it, just to think, just just to hear that, like this white kid, the skinny white kid is what he, you know, that you know that he called. He said this skinny white kid came up and blowed me away, but he didn't have many people who got up on stage and play with him, and he wouldn't show him what he was doing. <laughs> just yeah, it's just I I've listened to a lot of a lot of his stuff. Actually, you know what? Since we're in this kind of mood. I'm going to show you the one thing that impressed the ever living crap out of me when I was when I was learning how to play. I like I took like my dad to give um, some clarity. My dad, when I told when I announced to the world that I was going to play um, guitar. Or I wanted to learn how to play. Mm -hmm. He would only let me play. Here, let's switch it back so I can. Before I play this. Anyway, so he was so insistent on me playing acoustic. He, I couldn't. I didn't own my first electric until I was like eighteen. I didn't start playing until I was like thirteen, fourteen years old. He was so insistent. Acoustic. You're not getting electric. You're not. Yeah, I'm not buying it. Whatever. I mean. I had to work to get my first acoustic. My actual legit, well, I had the acoustic that I learned on was my mom's. It was a beginner classical guitar. It was like three quarter scale. Okay. Nylon yeah. strings. And then, so I uh, eventually went from that to a converted 
12 string guitar that was strung up as a six string. Wow. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I mowed mode or motor in order to get that. <laughs> um so and and I and I was listening to like Motley Crue. I mean, it's the stuff that we listened to back then, like Motley Crue, Poison, uh Skid Row. And, you know, because they were the guys that I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to do that. Uh, my mom's parents used to live in Carmel, Indiana, and we would go there and visit. And they had a fully furnished basement, much like yours. They had TV down there with cable. So one night I went down there and I was watching MTV and it was on TV unplugged. And I saw that Stevie Ray Vaughan was playing. This is where I'm going to flip over. And what I witnessed that guy do floored me. The technique, how clean it was, and it was on a 12-string guitar. Oh, really? And Joe Satriani was the other act on that uh, on that performance. He did uh, Pride and Joy, Scuttle Button. He did another song, too. But I'm going to go with Pride and Joy because that's what I can remember. Scuttlebutt was just a real fast, freaking kind of boogie kind of thing. And it was blew my mind, like the runs that he was doing. And he, it was effortless. Um, because a 12 string acoustic is kind of a different thing with the, the, the they're tuned in, in octaves. And you push down like two strings at once when you go to play one. So when you, so when you're playing, when you're playing, you know you may sound one string, but you're playing both, and so you're co- you're not covering one string, you're covering two. To so it's when whatever, and lo- yeah, it's a pain in the ass to tune too. But um, huh. anyway, I'm geeking out right now. I didn't think you're gonna do something like this. <laughs> so we're gonna do one. Hey, we're gonna do pride and joy off of that. Now, when you play, when you convert something from electric to acoustic, you have to make some adjustments because acoustic guitars don't have the same type of a sustain as a, as as a, as an electric. So there's usually some changes that ha- have to happen. This takes me back to being in that basement. I'm sitting in front of the TV, and I just could I my mouth was just open. Just getting it.
I like the angles that the TV uh, I know, right? cameras are getting. Yeah. Because that's that they're really making it personal. Like he's right. really playing to you. Well, that's what I really appreciate about like unplugged, like the especially the early ones, like the how the camera was used to create this like intimate atmosphere, like yeah. within the room and but with the the viewer, like you said, like the angles, like it just felt like you were in that room looking, or like right in front of them, like it's sitting, drooling, like I would have been. And he didn't start off as being a singer either. He had a pretty, I think he had a pretty good singing voice for, for a blues player. And one of the things with acoustic guitars is you, like six or 12, you can't fake anything. You have to be, I think when we get, when I come out of this, I'll like, I'll, I'll show you, I'll try to, to demonstrate, but like, you can't fake anything. You have to fret what you're doing. You have to literally be fretting what you're doing in order to get to sound, to sound good. Look how pretty that guitar is. Oh, yeah. Nice. It just made... I just... I just, I don't have words. Like, I just remember being a teenager seeing him play, and I just couldn't, I couldn't wrap my head around it. You know what I mean? Like, I just, like, oh, my God, he's doing what? So, I'm going to embarrass myself. <laughs> There we go. So this is my one of my acoustic guitar that I own. I'm hoping I can get, make this sound good. So on an acoustic, like the action is different. So you have to fret it. You can't. You can't uh, on electrics, especially when you're using distortion or any kind of effect. You kind of, you know, you have to fret it. Okay. So that's what made me like, you know, just you have to fret it in order to get it sound sound good. You have to fret it. Where as an electric, I'm not going to plug one in right now, but. The electric has a different feel, and you don't have to. You, if you play with a lot of distortion, a lot of guys that start off playing electric and they go to acoustic, they have a hard time with it because the tension is different and they're not used to it. So they have they. I don't want to say they struggle, but it's just a different thing for them. Mm -hmm. Whereas for if you're playing acoustic, you play electric. And I know the first time I played um, an electric guitar, uh, my buddy. John like says like what is this? He goes, You never played electric guitar? And I'm like, no. He goes, You're actually fretting like as I explained, you're he's like, you're actually fretting what you're doing. You're not you're not hiding behind anything. You oh, you're, oh. he he you could tell by watching me play that I was actually fretting it. I didn't 
I didn't lightly do it and I was able to sound the note with the pickups and the distortion and, and whatever effects were, were being used. But, uh, yeah, I, yeah, get me started. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Yeah. Um, you know what? Yeah. And again, it's fair, fair use. We don't own any of it. Um, please uh, go check out the recordings. Um, you know, give them some love. Um, and whatever you listen to your music, we're not making any money on this at all. This is two guys enjoying music. Uh, this was a very, very welcome diversion. Cool. This has probably kicked started my music podcast. Um, it probably did, but anyway, this is kind of a special thing. We may we may do this. Let us know if you want us to to do more of these. Um, we'd be more than happy to do them. Um, I would love to do them. Oh, for sure. I would have never thought to do this. I and I'm glad you picked that song because that song, like, it's just that it's just primal, like you know, just you know. Watch the Hulk and his fake freaking beard and his bleached freaking hair. It's like, you know, like, you know, <laughs> when he's goofing around or whatever. Um, yeah, and Hendrix was a fantastic player, too. If you can, find... Um, shit. There was... They played Austin City Limits. And his string broke. And his guitar tech at the time, who was coincidentally... The guitar tech for John Mayer. Check that shit out. Um, he, he it, it was flawless. He he steps behind him, takes the guitar as he's playing, takes the guitar off of him, puts the new one on him, and he didn't miss a beat. <laughs> I don't know how he. I, I've I've seen him do it, and it's very tricky because he 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 instead of put it, pulling it over his head, he would just disconnect the. He would just undo the strap on an end. It's kind of slide it around. Then the same bit with the other one. He just would take the new guitar, put it where he needed it, put it back on, and then was out. And it was so flawless. I loved it. I, it's it was the Austin City Limits performance. Which is slightly different from that one because he does he utilizes where he kind of like he um, the tempo slows down and he kind of does some stuff where he's just like more like the Hendrix where he's just and he putting the guitar behind his back and that's yeah, fun. That's that was that's that was a fun performance to watch too. Wow. We'll have to go back and check that out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll sh yeah, I'll send it if I can find it. Um, but um, uh, so um, just to kind of we we understand that we've been gone for a while. <laughs> um, you know, we're we're hopefully we're back and on in some kind of consistent uh, schedule um, to what we can do. Uh, we had a lot of things happen to, on both of our sides um, while we were away. Uh, we tried to record a week ago, and uh, because of my lack of understanding of modern technology. I wound up not recording it, so that's my fault. Um, uh, I guess uh, in the near future, we're going to be doing a review of uh, the Three Jokers. Um, we both had to kind of do a reread on it, um, and so maybe with some more reviews, um, of course, topical news. Uh, looks like we're going to be adding wrestling to our uh, to our melange of geekery because. Um, I've gotten into wrestling again, and uh, Phil, who likes wrestling as well, and uh, uh, Sue, my uh, my other partner in crime, who's really into wrestling. I asked, I inquired about a move done by Cody Rhodes. Okay. And I'm like, I've seen this before. The um. I can't, he's got too many. Is it the one where he falls on his back and then slaps the guy in the face? 
that's hilarious. That's not the one I'm talking about, but I laughed when I saw that one. That's like sheer, like, you know, Warner Brothers comedy, like, just slid him. Bam! It's like, It's the crossroads. Oh, right. His finisher. One of his finishers? I next thing I know, I get this like like lengthy explanation of like the variants, who used them, and then like it was kind of like he kind of left it at that. Then he hits back at me like at a later at a later date. Test used that move. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. It's not as fast as Cody's because right. Cody's like a smaller frame. Cody's to me looks more more violent. Yeah. Test was more brutal, but like Cody, because sometimes he it's fast. Like he just he'll he slaps it on and he he turn he turn he all of a sudden you see him twist. And the guy's on his back. It freaks me out, like, to watch it. But, yeah, I got this long. So he's really into wrestling, too. Um, I was kind of wanting to go into the um, the brackets for the AEW um, Women's Championship. Right. That's just happening, yeah. Because um, I saw a breakdown. Shivani did a breakdown. And I saw it on YouTube. And, um... You know, wanting the fans to interact and stuff like that. I don't know who who I would pick to be the finalist for on the Japanese side. I don't I don't know them. Which be given to the gap, I don't know who any of them are because they're from like New Japan or those places from over there. I know right. one of the AEW um, people. I either they went over there to wrestle in the tournament or they're wrestling on the American side, but they're they're of Asian descent. I don't remember who the woman's name is. Um Asia Kong, maybe? It's something like that. Uh, um yeah. she was in that Netflix uh series Glow. Um, oh really? But she's yeah, she's a, a a seasoned veteran and uh I so on the American side, I feel that okay ultimately i would like to see and i don't know i don't know them very well i would ultimately like because i know they have a woman who's holding a title but i don't know what the title is um sarah sarah something uh serena deep yeah right i know she's holding a title i don't know how that what this plays into with what they're doing I don't know what the title is. I just know she holds a title. Um, I would, I feel that they're, pu I don't know if they're, I don't feel so much of a push for her. I saw, I, it feels like there's a real big push for um, Britt Baker. Yeah, she's a uh, one, she was like the first woman to sign with AEW. Right. Um, um, I just feel there's a real huge push for her. The other one that I would like to see make it, at least into the semifinals. I want to see uh, Anna make it. Yeah. With um, with Brody's with with Brody's passing, I don't necessarily know if they're if she's ready to do that yet. Um, they seem to be, from what I could tell, with the lack of watching her, and I, I don't mean to be insulting. They seem to have her paired up as a tag as a tag partner uh, with um, Tay, Tay, Taya. Yep, Tay Conti. Yeah, and she's in the tournament too. I think it would be interesting if they both wrestled each other. I think mm. it would be neat for Anna that to would go be, to the semifinals. That would be good drama. I, um, I but I seem to think that Britt Baker is going to be the big push. I'm sorry. I I, I feel that too. Um, uh, or she'll make it to the semifinals and then, you know, might not make it depending on who she's going against. Like maybe a Anna or a, or whoever. Um, yeah, Anna's story is pretty amazing. Like when she first debuted in AEW. Right. 
Like that was like her seventh match. Yeah, ever. So like five like, or six. Yeah, live, she had wrestled live, very live long. in front of the crowd. So she's she's you know the epitome of a rookie, but she does she's, very well right in the ring yeah. and you know telling the story of, right. of what she's doing and everything. Do you know how she got her arrived at her number for ninety nine? Um, so a lot of people, uh, it was Brody that gave her the number. Yes. And a lot of people were thinking that it was the character from Get Smart. Mm -hmm. uh, the TV the show. Female, yeah. show. Right. But it, I guess Brody was a big hockey fan. Yes. And that's when Wayne Gretzky's number, right? That was Gretzky's number, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, she, in the interview that she did with, uh, Chris Jericho, um, she was asked, she said, how did, do you know? And she's like, well, you know, I, I don't watch hockey. And he, yeah, Brody liked hockey. Um, and when I hear Brody's story, I wished I would have seen more of him in AEW, not so much WWF, because he seemed to play, he, he was a background character to uh, the, the Bray Wyatt. But you hear these, I was listening to the, Jericho did a, like a celebration thing for him and had people talking about him and it was just like, he, he was a, he, he was on his way. A guy who struggled and went into WWE and was frustrated because they wanted to pay him. They wanted to play a guy from Rochester, New York as a Southern hillbilly. Yeah. And he um, could do a Southern accent. He struggled with a Southern accent, so. Uh, yeah, I've been I've enjoyed everything that Brody's done mm -hmm. uh, in AEW. It, it's it he really brought legitimacy to that faction that he uh, yeah the Dark Order joined up with. So. Yeah, it worked. It just worked. Like I've seen, like I watched the BET stuff. Now, are those segments in between Dark or Dynamite? That can't be its own show. Uh, I think it's a lot of it's before Dynamite because AEW Dark is kind of after Dynamite because it goes into uh, the night. Well, yeah, but those are like more of the dark matches that don't. What I like about it is uh, it used to be a dark match. You didn't know who was wrestling right. unless you were there and the lights weren't even turned on for that. What I like is that it's a it's like a a developer that they actually get to see how they move on TV, how they act, or are they going to be, you know, like if they need work, if they don't need work, you know, give them a contract, whatever. I I find that to be more entertaining than watching Raw or SmackDown. Yeah. I hate I, to say I that. Like, I like... You get to see, like, up and comers too, and right. You know what I'm saying? Maybe if they, even if they don't make it, you know what I mean. Like just giving them a shot. You know, they, sometimes they're not even have a contract yet. Right. Here, here, you know, we're gonna switch in here. This is what we want you to do. We want you to do you in your character. I also like the the kind of. I don't want to word it. I don't. I don't want to use the word gimmick, but I love the gimmick kind of like you know six man tag. 12 man tag. I didn't see, I hadn't heard anything like that since like the, what, the early, the late 70s, early 80s when promotions used to do that crap. Like the, the, the Thunderbird or the, the fabulous, um, shit. Like the Horseman versus, um, P.S. Hayes group. I can't remember the, the, the fabulous Freebirds. Yeah. Like stuff like that with like added personnel. Like I, like I hadn't seen anything like that. A, you know, WWE won't do it, and I in any of their formats. They they've really gone away from that. They they they're definitely just uh. The only thing I don't really want openly bad mouth is NXT because one I have never watched it, and it's supposed to be like their developing program, and Hunter's leading it, and I think Hunter probably has more really great ideas on how to deal with, to do it than Vince does. And I think it's a matter of like either Vince when he finally steps down 
and is no longer involved. Will you see, you know, the WWE be what it was? I don't know if that's true or not, or there's an early assumption, but yeah, uh, I think NXT was was um, really popular um, yeah. coming up, and you got to see a whole, a lot of people that you weren't used to seeing. Um, right. I think since a lot of guys have been called up to like the main roster, right? I I don't know if like the NXT brand feels a little, um, you know, lacking now. I yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's it's hard to say. Right. Um, yeah. Again, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. I, I really really don't know. All I know, like I like the concept of the fiend, the visual look of him. But I don't think he's 